but is something that I would like, uh, as well as something that you might like as well, we might still be shown different images because I might be interested in House of God for a different reason than you might be. So, so that's, you know, like uh, from the perspective of our consumers, uh, this is a great application of machine learning. But applicability of machine learning at Netflix goes way beyond this. This is just like, you know, the proverbial tip of the iceberg. So let's, let's peel this layer and see, you know, like what are some of the other areas where we end up applying machine learning. So I don't have a business background, but uh, this is sort of like a very, very naive version of what our business model is like. Uh, consumers like you, consumers like me, we sign up for Netflix. Uh, we log into the page. Uh, there is a recommendation system at work, uh, which is sort of like uh, allowing us to discover new content. Then we hit play. Uh, at that point in time, the control is passed to our content distribution network, which then delivers all of those video streaming bits onto your uh, personal favorite device, whether it's a cell phone, your television screen, or your favorite gaming console. And if we are winning that moment of truth, if you are able to find something that sort of like engages you, you will continue to be our uh, subscriber. You'll continue to pay us money every single month. Uh, that pays for me to be here, uh, pays for my bills, uh, as well as it pays for all of our marketing costs so that we could uh, attract new subscribers, as well as it pays for our library of content, uh, content that we license, content that we produce, content that we buy from other studios. And, uh, this is kind of like a positive feedback cycle, right? If we keep our users happy, they'll stick around with us for longer, they'll pay us more money, that will allow us to create more and more good content, and so the cycle will continue. And this sort of like leads to a whole bunch of interesting data science problems, right? So for example, here, uh, our recommendation algorithm is something that we call PVR, uh, Product Video Ranker, uh, that, as I said before, is one of the biggest piece of uh, machine learning application that we have. Then uh, at the same time, on any given day, Netflix is responsible for uh, roughly around 30 to 40% of uh, downstream internet traffic, uh, which is huge. And uh, what we do is every single time when you are clicking play, at that point in time, the control passes to our content distribution network. These are uh, physical boxes that Netflix builds and ships to all of the ISPs and internet exchange points. So it's more than likely that when you hit play on House of Cards, those bits are actually coming from somewhere from Airtel's office and are not at all making their way to uh, the internet backbone. So every single day, our data scientists, they need to predict what kind of content is going to be popular in any given geographical area so that then we can seed that content on that box because these boxes, even though they are highly optimized for uh, video throughput, they still have limited uh, storage capacity. So once you get uh, the video content, you will continue paying uh, your subscription. We have upwards of 160 million members all around the world. That makes us one of the world's biggest uh, subscription service. And uh, with e-commerce transactions also comes fraud. So we need to be very vigilant around how do we process uh, payments, uh, how do we fight fraud, how do we fight abuse. We want to make sure that you know people just don't abuse our free trial mechanism and so on and so forth. So that's where we apply a lot of machine learning to. Then once we, uh, once the users are watching, we have to also pay a close attention at their behavior. We need to identify, are they at the risk of churning out? Uh, are they reaching out to customer service? Is their interaction with any of our customer service agent uh, delightful? So we uh, make sure that their journey, they don't run into any sort of like paper cuts as far as using our service is concerned. So that again, uh, utilizes a lot of uh, natural language processing, a lot of statistics, uh, deep, deep area. Now we have all of this money that we have collected from all of these people. Uh, we need to make a decision around like, okay, how do we split this money? Uh, we need to make sure that you know, we are able to market our content effectively to people who are not yet uh, Netflix subscribers, uh, members in India, members in Brazil, uh, potential members. And uh, so we are pretty big on computational advertising. Uh, trying to figure out uh, when you are on Facebook, when you're on Google, what is it that you might be interested in? Uh, do we have that piece of content? And maybe we might just show you an ad over there which will make you click on it and then sign up for our service. And then at the same time, uh, we are right now one of the world's biggest studio, uh, one of the world's biggest uh, buyer of content, uh, one of the world's biggest animation studio as well, uh, spending billions of dollars uh, every single year. And content production, it's, it's a very human intensive business. Uh, any typical uh, production will see 1,000 to 5,000 people working on it. 
so how do we make sure that we are a technology first uh, business, a technology first studio, making sure that uh, we are leveraging data science, we are leveraging uh, scheduling policies uh, to make sure that uh, the money that our subscribers are uh, trusting us with, uh, we are making the best efficient use of it. So this sort of like uh, keeps our data scientists incredibly busy. You know, these are like wide, diverse set of problems uh, where for some problems they have access to petabytes of data, for other problems the data set is super sparse, for some problems uh, their models uh, need to support, you know, uh, low 10 millisecond response times uh, when scoring these models. Uh, some of these models need to be refreshed very frequently every few minutes. Some of these models are refreshed like you know once a quarter, once a month. So, so there's a diverse set of use cases, a diverse set of approaches uh, that our data scientists use, which means that uh, they use all the tips, tricks, trade, craft uh, of machine learning, uh, you know, you name it, and we would use it. Whether it's languages like Python, R, Julia, uh, packages like TensorFlow, people write their own packages. Uh, and that makes my life a little bit difficult. So my team is the machine learning infrastructure team. And my team's responsibility is to make sure that our data scientists are as productive as possible, and they are able to focus on data science and not on engineering. Uh, let me expand on that a little bit more. So let's say you're a data scientist. I'm pretty sure most of you in the room are data scientists. and uh, this is what a typical data scientist looks like, uh, and you would identify well with them. So the data scientist starts to work on a business problem. Uh, so somebody would come to them and they would be like, hey, here's a business metric that is like really, really important for the business, and you need to somehow optimize it. You will spin up your notebook, you'll have access to some data, you'll get down to number crunching, you'll slice and dice your data, you'll figure out like various different ways around how to optimize that business metric, what to do next. You would use, let's say, you know, off-the-shelf uh, packages like TensorFlow. Maybe you will write your own uh, training code. Then all of this code, it needs to run on some data set, right? So you would end up like writing these copious amounts of ETLs, uh, maybe in Python, maybe in some other language, uh, to get access to this data so that then you can feed this data into your model. And then you would want to schedule like uh, these models, uh, these ETLs somewhere, right? Like ultimately these cannot always run on your laptop. Your laptop has limited resources. So, so you would need to maybe run it on the cloud. Maybe your organization has its own uh, data center. Something needs to happen, right? So compute needs to move away from your laptop, away from a local notebook onto some remote compute. And these days, you know, Docker is in the vogue. So you would be required to sort of like convert, translate everything into containers and then execute on top of that. But a model by itself is worthless until unless it's actually used somewhere, right? So uh, you would then package your model yet again into a container. Maybe you want to host it as an API. Maybe you want to just, you know, do some sort of like batch scoring. Again, more containers. And uh, these services will then feed, let's say, some internal dashboard, maybe some other engineering service. So for example, our recommendation systems might be hitting these API endpoints to fetch the most relevant uh, recommendation for you. Uh, in some other cases, our content executives might be relying on some internal dashboards uh, for some content analysis. Maybe if you get lucky, your stakeholders are happy. They'll come back to you with more demands, uh, more features, and you'll be super busy. And if you look at this diagram, the actual part where the data scientist is spending time on data science, it's, it's pretty minimal. Most of your time is sort of like spent on writing these copious amounts of ETLs, figuring out where to get your data from, uh, scheduling your compute. If you have to do any sort of like distributed computing, then you're sort of like expected to become suddenly a pseudo systems engineer trying to figure out like how to do that. Uh, if you need uh, GPUs, then you're sort of like left wondering what are like some of the good, nice little abstractions that will get you access to that. Uh, and if anything fails, then it's, it's really difficult to triage what's happening. And uh, data science is a very iterative process, so it's almost guaranteed that the very first approach that you'll try will not always work. So uh, there'll be a plethora of models that you are sort of like working with at any given point in time. So you need to keep track of like, what are the various different experiments that you have launched, uh, which ones are working, which ones are not. So there needs to be this component of experimentation management and tracking as well. That's, that's a lot of work for a single data scientist to sort of solve. And uh, most of these problems are sort of like common to 
all of the data science problems, right? These are like very agnostic to any sort of like uh, the tool or the technique uh, or the action machine learning approach that you're using. And, and that's where my team comes in. Um, so let's, let's look at the machine learning data stack uh, and uh, let's, let's see, you know, like if there are like uh, certain conclusions that we can draw from there. Uh, so machine learning is predated on data. You need to have access to the data. So most of the modern organizations, they use cloud, whether it's AWS, GCP, Azure, and they have a data lake. Uh, this data lake could be on Amazon S3, it could be HDFS, uh, GCS, Azure Blob Store, something of that nature where you have all of your organization's data pretty well laid out. Then you need access to compute resources. You need to do something with that data. You need to crunch that data. Uh, these days, people use Kubernetes. Uh, if you're on AWS, then you might be using uh, EKS or Elastic Container Service. A plethora of options available where you know, like you have these commodity hardwares and um, you just want to make sure that you have these containers and somehow you are able to just orchestrate that compute on uh, the needed resource and it can access the data. Then you need to make sure that you know, it can run autonomously, so you need to be able to orchestrate it. So for example, Apache Airflow by Airbnb is a very popular project that people use to sort of like piece together all of these ETLs uh, uh, so that these can run autonomously uh, once people have figured out what they need to execute. You need to build those containers, so you need to now all of a sudden become an expert uh, in Docker uh, and writing Docker files. Looks very simple, but it's, it's kind of like very difficult uh, once you uh, look at some of the efficiency gains that people can make by being better at it. You have multiple models at any given point in time. Uh, you're experimenting a lot, so you need to have some way of keeping track of all of that metadata. You're making constant changes to the code. You're making constant changes to the hyperparameters. Uh, maybe you know you have like a small little diary where you're keeping track of all of this. Maybe you're relying on Git, but then again, uh, people are not really sure how to use Git for like uh, code plus data. So different people have different sort of like best practices. So to say that work for them might not work for other people. Then you have the development environment, right? So uh, if you are a Pythonista, then you might want to use Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, if you are in the R universe, then you might want to use R Studio. If you are a Scala uh, person, then there's one project that my team recently open sourced uh, called Polynote, which is a Scala first uh, notebook. Please do check it out. You'll have some access to some development environment. And then the next thing is, uh, the actual ML library, right? Like, do I use TensorFlow? Do I use PyTorch? Do I use XGBoost? What is it that I use to train my model? Now, from a data scientist's point of view, they don't care if the data is stored in Amazon S3 or HDFS or GCS or magnetic tapes. They want quick and fast and efficient access to data so that they can get their job done. Uh, they don't care, you know, like if the infrastructure that's provisioned by the engineering team is Kubernetes or ECS. They want a set of GPUs, they just want that. They don't care you know, if it's running on Kubernetes or if it's running in some place, somebody's cupboard. So, so as you go higher up the stack, that's, that's where like, you know, like the data scientists would like to operate. Uh, they deeply care whether they are using TensorFlow or PyTorch. If you go into your organization and if you tell your data scientists that, hey, you cannot use TensorFlow, you have to use PyTorch, they will not feel happy about it. But if you go and say that, hey, you know, we are just switching out uh, the data leak from S3 to HDFS, they wouldn't care about it. They would be like, yeah, do whatever the F you want to do. <laughs> so, so, but on the flip side, you know, for engineers like us, uh, all the systems engineers, uh, uh, the, the situation is sort of like lopsided. Uh, there are incredible people doing incredibly good amount of work uh, in the open source community when it comes to writing all of these uh, algorithmic packages. Uh, but then uh, making sure that, you know, your data lake is set up uh, properly, you have fast and efficient access to the data, uh, you have your uh, clusters well set up, uh, you have your Airflow deployed, uh, people can uh, do CI CD on top of Docker files, uh, you have a metadata versioning story all set up. That requires a lot of work, right? And that's where uh, my team comes in and we were like, hey, what if we had explicit opinions on how data should be laid out, how compute should be performed, and if we could let sort of like our data scientists dictate uh, what sort of packages do they want to do, uh, want to use, what sort of machine learning approaches do they want to use, that would sort of be a happy medium, and that's what Metaflow is all about. So Metaflow is Netflix's machine learning infrastructure. So uh, this last year in December, uh, we made an open source release uh, at AWS reInvent, so you can actually check out the code uh, on GitHub. So what it does is it provides this unified abstraction uh, 
across this entire stack that allows our data scientists to be more of data scientists and focus less on engineering. Let's see how that happens. So this is what any machine learning code at the end of the day looks like. A machine learning code is nothing but an ETL at the end of the day. Uh, your extract remains extract, your transform becomes train, and your load becomes deploy. So you have some function, and this function is essentially operating on some data set uh, to produce some result. What Metaflow does is it allows you to sort of like declare your computation as a directed acyclic graph. And the fact that you, know, you declared it as a DAG, it sort of like provides for a lot of interesting uh, facilities. So in this particular example, we have these five different steps. You have a step start, you have two parallel steps, A and B. They all uh, go to the same step join, and then uh, the step ends. And what's happening here is what Metaflow is doing is it will automatically schedule these computations. Uh, the step A and B, these would be executed in parallel. So if you look at the code, uh, all of these steps are pure Python functions. They are just annotated by this add step. That is what Metaflow introduces. And uh, that sort of like allows people to just uh, very easily uh, declare their functions as a graph. The one big feature that Metaflow provides for is uh, automated state transfer, right? Like as soon as I said DAG, like people who are familiar with Apache Airflow, they would have been like, okay, you know, how is it different than Airflow? Or you know, there are like a whole bunch of other tools uh, which allow people to express uh, their compute as a DAG, like it's not really a new idea. But in almost all of those tools, uh, the nodes of the graph, they are sort of like assumed to be isolated units of computation. And any state transfer that needs to happen between those nodes, it's sort of like left as an exercise to the reader. And then people are always wondering that, hey, you know, what sort of data should I pass from like my container to the other container? Should I be conservative about storing all of this data? Should I be not? Now the fact is that you know, storage is incredibly cheap. And when things fail, you need to make sure that you have access to like all the tracking history, like whatever went wrong. At that point in time, you definitely realize that, okay, maybe it might have been a good idea if I had just like recorded the entire world at that point in time. And that's what Metaflow does. So in this particular example, uh, in the step start, we set the variable x as zero. And then in step A and B, we increment x by two in step A and by three in step B. And then magically, uh, these values are available to all these subsequent steps. So in step A, uh, we already have a notion of like what the value of step X is going to be. And then in the join step, we just take the maximum of that and then we finish the workflow. And what we do behind the scenes is that every single time any of your step uh, finishes, uh, we would actually snapshot that entire state into S3. So let's say you know your workflow for some reason fails at step B. Now, instead of re-executing your entire flow, because we have already snapshotted uh, the execution state, you can resume from where your um, workflow failed. Uh, you can make like tiny little fixes, and then you can uh, get on with it. As well as at the same time, you know, if things have gone wrong anywhere, or you just want to know like what was happening in any given uh, step, at any later point in time, you can come back and see uh, what the state of your workflow was. And Metaflow also brings in uh, core abstractions around model operations. So every single time you execute your workflow, uh, we create a dedicated namespace for that particular user. We allocate it uh, and increasing run ID. So the first time you execute, you'll have a run ID one. The next time you execute, run ID two, so on and so forth. And then we bundle in a client API so that at any point in time in the future, in your notebook, in your favorite IDE, you can go back and you can look at like, hey, I want to know what was the workflow that Seven executed? What was the latest run? Can you give me the ID? Can you give me like some of the tags associated with that? Can you tell me like what the state of the uh, union was? Uh, what was the train model? So on and so forth. Uh, in the previous example, uh, this self.x value, so you'd have access to the self.x value uh, using this um, client API. And what this allows you to do is, you know, let's say you trained a model, and if you have self.model equals my model, then you have access to all the models that you have trained for any of your previous runs, and then you can embed those in any of your API services very easily. We also allow for uh, real-time monitoring, so uh, you can monitor the status of your workflow, and then you can take uh, necessary actions. Uh, a lot of time, people uh, talk about like you know what can we have sort of like a model monitoring solution? Can we build this like one single UI that rules them all? Uh, where we can see uh, how my model training process is behaving, what are like some of the key metrics that I need to track, so on and so forth. 
But the reality of the situation is that the user set that we had to address, uh, they have very diverse user needs, right? Uh, there are people who are training deep learning models. There are people who are just concerned with like classical statistics. There are people training logistic regression. There are people, you know, who want to, uh, who have like custom metrics that they want to expose and store. And we felt that uh, notebooks by themselves are an incredibly great piece of UI. And if we just provide like the necessary set of abstractions where people can just very easily spin up those dashboards, uh, it would be sort of like a win-win. So kind of like help you do that. The key point uh, at the end of the day is uh, we live in the world of cloud. Uh, you have access to incredible resources at your fingertips. And uh, model development, uh, model training, it usually starts out on your laptop, but then your laptop has limited capacity, you know, like high-end laptops, they top out at like 16 gigs of RAM. More often than not, your data set, your data sizes are, you know, much larger than that, 100 gigs, 200 gigs, terabytes, petabytes. Uh, you might want access to, let's say, you know, eight GPUs. Many laptops don't have eight GPUs. How do you do that? Like, at that point in time, is the expectation that somehow you take that code, you package it out, and then you somehow deploy it? Like, it causes a lot of cognitive overhead for data scientists. Now we are asking them to do something, be a professional that they are not really trained for, right? Like even for software engineers, it's really hard to take a piece of code and then deploy it and uh, run it with like some specific resources. You have like a lot of different steps to hop. Expecting somebody who was not traditionally trained uh, in a field is sort of like a recipe for disaster at the end of the day. So, so Metaflow relies on this notion of decorators. So you can have your steps. You can just uh, decorate them with uh, whatever kind of resources you want. So for example, in this case, uh, you can specify that, hey, my step A needs to run with on an instance with uh, 16 CPUs. My step B, it needs to run on an instance with 200 gigs of RAM. And what we are doing behind the scenes is we are packaging your function. We are running it on top of a Docker container on an instance which has these resources. And for a user, uh, if you know they want to now be like, hey, instead of 16 CPUs, I want 32 CPUs. All they need to do is just switch out CPU equals 16 to CPU equals 32. And that's, that's an incredibly big productivity booster. There's another point that I would like to mention here. Uh, so the Google MapReduce paper uh, written by Jeffrey Dean uh, and others, it came out in 2004. At that point in time, uh, the state of the art machine that you could get on AWS, uh, a general purpose EC2 instance, it had like 1.6 gigs of RAM. And if you go to AWS today, uh, you would be able to get upwards of 750 gigs of RAM. So what it means is that a lot of processing, a lot of problems that needed MapReduce, that needed distributed compute in 2004, even in 2014, can now actually be solved on one single box because the boxes have become bigger. Uh, what that means is, you know, any given day, it's much more easier for people to think about a problem that is solved on one single box, uh, which is not really distributed, because as soon as you go in the distributed world, you are opening yourself to a much higher rate of failures, triaging errors is very difficult, uh, recognizing what the state of the system is, it's, it's very difficult, right? And increasingly, it's possible that more and more of your problems can be actually solved on one big box. And uh, we highly recommend our users to take uh, advantage of that before actually thinking about uh, offloading their compute to, let's say, you know, Spark, Presto, Hive, uh, or just writing their own MapReduce. But then that hits a limit at some point in time. At some point in time, you are like, no, I need to process petabytes of data, terabytes of data. No one single box can do that. Tell me how to do that. And that's where, you know, uh, we sort of like provide some other primitives where people can parallelize their compute. So for example, in this uh, scenario, we have this uh, abstraction called for each, uh, which is listed in this tip called start, uh, where you can just uh, do sort of like a hyperparameter search, right? So for example, in this case, uh, we have this list called grid, which has these three parameters, x, y, and z. And, uh, the user can now very easily just run three isolated instances of compute, and these instances of compute can be on their local laptop, or it can be on the cloud with whatever needed resources that they want, and uh, they can get their job done. Now, it's kind of like super, I wouldn't say super easy, but it's, it's still straightforward to sort of like farm out your compute, uh, do this uh, parallel compute. 
What's incredibly difficult is bringing all of these results together in one single instance and then making sense of it. And Metaflow sort of like does that for you um, out of the box. So the join step will wait for all of the steps to finish. Uh, it has all the retrying mechanisms and then it will bring back results from all of these individual uh, compute units and then it will allow users to sort of like uh, do any sort of like compute on top of that. And then, you know, you, as a user, you can sort of like pair all of these two uh, paradigms together of horizontal and vertical scalability, and then all of a sudden you can be like, hey, you know, maybe I want to launch a thousand containers in parallel, and each of those containers need to use like eight GPUs, I need to have like 500 gigs of RAM. And a lot of our internal users actually do that. So they have workflows where uh, one single workflow would be farming out compute to thousands of containers. And just, just think of it, right? Like a data scientist without actually having any deep uh, systems engineering background, all of a sudden they have this power where they are just writing very simple idiomatic Python code that they have always been familiar with. And that compute uh, can run on instances where, you know, like the cluster size uh, kind of like rivals like most supercomputers in the world. And that doesn't even need for them to know anything about like what high performance computing is all about. Another big factor that I'm pretty sure you know like has bitten a lot of us in the room uh, is around dependency management. So machine learning is a very fast moving world. So things change all the time. Uh, you have new versions of TensorFlow coming out. You have new versions of PyTorch, new versions of Pandas, and all of these libraries. They have like very complicated dependency structure. You know, like if you are pulling in TensorFlow, it will pull in like thousands of different dependencies, and these dependencies can change at any point in time. It could be the case that you train the model, everything was working fine. You go home, you come back next morning, you try to execute things, and things have just failed. Uh, one reason could be that TensorFlow, for example, the has a unpinned dependency on pandas. Pandas changes all the time. Many times they have backward incompatible changes, and you didn't change anything, uh, but the world apparently changed, and uh, now things don't work. Uh, it could be the situation that you know you trained a model, you deployed it into production, and now things are not working, and you want to like figure out, hey, what really happened? Can I somehow replay that compute? But then you realize that, oops, my dependencies have moved, my data has moved, uh, I can't really re-execute uh, my compute uh, to sort of like get back to the stage and sort of like step through that, uh, trying to triage and debug uh, those potential issues. So, so dependency management and reproducibility, they sort of like go hand in hand. And uh, there has been a lot of effort uh, in academia uh, within the machine learning community around like just building algorithms and approaches that sort of like treat reproducibility as a first class citizen. But uh, that sort of like is just half the battle, right? You need to make sure that uh, your infrastructure uh, is also capable of introducing uh, this notion of reproducibility. Uh, when it comes to code, uh, there's usually some sort of like version control system. Uh, you can just like snapshot the entire code and have some sort of like poor man's version of version control and take care of that. Uh, storage is incredibly cheap, so you can just make sure that you know you have immutable snapshots of data and you can uh, keep track of that. Uh, when it comes to dependencies. Uh, then things get a little bit murky. What do I do, right? Uh, one very valid option is that you know you are just baking your own Docker images at that point in time because the Docker image is baked. Uh, you have your dependencies kind of like locked and loaded, and then every single time you can just like reuse that Docker container. But then writing Docker files is really hard. Like if I uh, pick you and tell you that, hey, you know, let's create a Docker container which has TensorFlow GPU installed with TensorRT. It's going to take a whole bunch of Googling to figure out like, okay, you know, like what are the transitive dependencies? What are the things? What are the drivers that I need to install? How do I need to bake it? So on and so forth. And again, that's cognitive overhead for people, right? So, so what Metaflow does um, offer its users is it offers this uh, another abstraction, another decorator called Conda, uh, which happens to be a really nice uh, open source package manager. Uh, it's agnostic uh, to Python. It has packages uh, in the Python world, in the R world, uh, all the system packages as well, and has a good amount of traction in the data science community as well. So we allow our users to sort of like specify what sort of dependencies they want. And uh, because we are in this DAG world where we have these sort of like different steps, uh, our users can specify different dependencies. You can have a workflow where you know you are training two models in parallel with different versions of TensorFlow just to make sure that okay, you know, if TensorFlow upgraded, did it cause any sort of like statistical imbalance in your model, uh, which is like really powerful. 
what we are doing behind the scenes is uh, we are inspecting all the dependencies that you have specified. We do a dependency resolution. We cache all the dependencies uh, for you in perpetuity uh, in S3 so that, you know, if let's say you are depending on some esoteric package and that package disappears uh, for some reason from the upstream repository, you're not left high and dry. You still have access to that. And this sort of like allows us to replicate uh, the sort of like closure uh, in any sort of like um, uh, any sort of compute instance. So you can execute this step prep with just pandas on your local laptop, and you can execute it on the cloud, or you can host it as a microservice, and you're guaranteed the exact same environment. And this environment is going to be isolated from any other environment, even if they are running on the same instance. And then the next big thing is that, hey, I have created this model, it works, I have all the facilities that I needed, all the bells and whistles, it scales out effortlessly, now I need it to run uh, autonomously. Uh, now I need it to actually do some work, right? And more often than not, you would have noticed that, you know, like that means that when the data scientist needs to move from a development environment to sort of like a deployment environment, uh, in many organizations, that necessitates a rewrite. Then people start working with software engineers, uh, ML engineers, data engineers, and they're like, hey, let me rewrite in a fashion so that uh, it's consumable by whatever my workflow scheduler is, whatever my uh, web services are, and so on and so forth. And that again, you know, like sort of like causes a disconnect where now the data scientist work is being utilized in a fashion that the data scientist is not familiar with. Uh, the software engineers, they are rewriting uh, data science code that they don't have familiarity with. And these two people, these two set of people, they speak different vocabularies, so often a lot gets lost in translation. Uh, so what we allow is again, you know, like you can just like type Python microflow.py workflow create, and we would automatically deploy it onto uh, your workflow scheduler um, of interest. Could be Airflow. Internally, we use uh, our own um, scheduler called Mason. Uh, so Metaflow supports all of those um, as plugins. So yeah, that that was about Metaflow. I purposefully kept the presentation very broad uh, and very high level. Uh, I would be happy to take questions if you have uh, if you want to know more about anything in depth. Uh, the project is now open source, uh, so you can go to the website at metaflow.org. Uh, all you need to get started uh, with Metaflow is just do a pip install Metaflow and you'll have everything available. Uh, if your organization uh, doesn't have access to cloud, we also offer a sandbox. Uh, the details for that uh, are in the documentation. Uh, that's all like allows you to play around with Metaflow, experience what cloud scale is like. Um, yeah. So yes, this was me. Uh, Thank you for coming, and if you have any questions, I would be happy to take those on. Yes, please. They don't refresh until unless you take an explicit action. That's the entire point around it, right? So let's say you want a specific version of Pandas, we have to give you that specific version of Pandas every single time. Because if you have, let's say, unpinned dependencies, then you are sort of like bringing in entropy uh, into your system, and uh, then you don't really have confidence that, okay, once I've deployed something, uh, every single time, let's say, you know, your pipeline re-executes, you will have the exact same execution environment, and that's something that we want to guarantee. Correct, but with every successful execution of my script, can't we go back and update, uh, um, say, the previous uh, installed version of, say, Pandas itself? So, the difference between uh, a traditional software engineering code and a machine learning code is this definition of successful execution. Just because your workflow executed without crashing doesn't mean that it's a successful execution, right? Uh, there could be certain changes that just change the nature of your predictions that would be really hard to capture. And at times, or almost every single time, I would rely on our data scientists to sort of like cache that, track that, because they are the most informed around that. And they are happy to switch it to a latest version, run it, verify that yes, it works fine, and then switch out the version. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh. So we define the resources with the aggregate resources tag, mm -hmm. right? So on uh, any cloud platform, let's say AWS, yes. we have uh, compute instances with instance type defined. Mm -hmm. So le let's say MLP2x large. Yes. Yes. So how does that scale? So we say 16 uh, cores and 
200 GBs of RAM. Yes. So does the platform decides on itself that? Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, you know, the number, uh, the names are really cryptic when it comes to instance types, and uh, these instance types are also changing all the time. You know, Amazon comes up with like new architectures, new servers, and we don't want our data scientists to sort of like worry about that. So instead of them specifying that, hey, I want a P2 instance type or I want an M4 instance type, they just care about like 200 gigs of RAM, 16 CPUs, four GPUs, and that's sort of like the layer of abstraction uh, that is the most productive for them, rather than like Googling what are the kind of instance types that are available and just like slapping in that exact same string. Yes, please. My question would be extension of what he asked. Uh, mm -hmm. Do we need to really specify the number of GPUs or Metaflow will determine this? This is the ideal number of GPUs based on the workload. Uh, not currently. So we ask our users to be explicit about the kind of resources that they need uh, because I don't think there's any system currently that can automatically figure out uh, the GPU requirements uh, out of the box. Hi, I have a question. Uh, yes, please. Okay. See, uh, is it you have only the AWS implementation for this yes. Metaflow, or yep. you have like Google Cloud and you know, Azure? Uh, you have. So Netflix is an AWS shop, so we run almost entirely on AWS. Uh, so Metaflow has been in production for two and a half years now, and when we went open source, our first bet was like, okay, let's just go with AWS implementations because that's something that has been battle tested. Um, if you go on our GitHub page, uh, there's significant interest in offering uh, GCP and Azure integrations, and that's something that we're deliberating on. So as, it's like in development. It will take time to deploy this solution in the, those two clouds, like Azure uh, and... So, so if, you, if you look at uh, what we are using the cloud for is, right, like it's compute and storage, right? Okay. And if you look at our code, like those integrations are actually very minimal. Um, so creating that implementation is not really going to be a hard work. But we also want to make sure that we are providing an amazing uh, experience to our end users. So we are not focused on integrating with every single uh, cloud provider out there, as long as we can make sure that the experience that people are getting is top notch. OK, last minute. Any last question? I think we are good. All right. Thank, Thank you, you so time. much, Savin.